Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Dellingpool. Welcome to the Dellingpool podcast with me, James Dellingpool, and my very special guest. And his name is Sven Hughes. And this is unusual, this podcast, because normally I pick people rather desperately and I'm, I'm looking around for, for new guests and I think, oh my God, it's my podcast to come this week. Who am I going to do? Sven was offered me on a plate um, and I've been told that Sven is going to be, this is an awful thing to say before a podcast. I've been told he's going to be really, really interesting and he's got so much to say. And actually, I have been reading about some of the stuff he's done and actually, I think he is going to be pretty cool. And I like him already. He's got a beard and, and glasses and he's smoking a vape, uh, which is a good thing. So Sven, welcome. Good to morning. The, Thank to, you. To the podcast. <laughs> Sven, we've got to go straight into Afghanistan because okay. that's where you cut your teeth. You've actually seen, oh, have, you, have you seen the elephant? Have you actually been shot at and stuff? Um, yes, I have been shot at, yes. Um, and is it, is it as, as Winston Churchill said, very exciting being shot at without result? It uh, focuses the mind, definitely. I was very glad to be surrounded by some very competent soldiers when I was shot at. It was part of a, a sort of journey I was on, really, when I was serving out in Afghanistan. I, I served, first of all, uh, as a reservist out in Afghanistan and then also went back as a sort of civilian consultant to work with their psychological operations team uh, uh, over there as well. Mm. So it was part of the process being shot at of learning that we had to find a better way to resolve the situation. And so being shot at was sort of indicative of the problem, which is we could solve this by talking to people and in, in, instead we were all shooting at each other. You know, there was a much better way of solving the problem, let's put yes. it that way. I think I'm with you. A few years ago, I went to address the regimental dinner of the Light Dragoons, and fantastic bunch of mm. chaps, and they were one of the first units to go out to Afghanistan on that first run. Yep. And they had some fantastic boys' own adventures there, as you can imagine. But my views on Afghanistan have changed quite drastically since then. I remember at the time I was quite gung-ho, and I was quite excited that our boys were going to get some combat experience. I mean, you remember there was that long period where, apart from the Falklands, our army was pretty much unused. Yes. And then suddenly you've got intense combat in Iraq and Afghanistan and, uh, and so on. So I was all gung-ho. Now I, I, I look at Afghanistan, I think, what a complete waste of time. We've, we've achieved nothing, have we, really? OK, there's two sides to that. If you're out there on the ground at a local level where the Taliban have been in a village yeah. or if they're skinning people and throwing them down the well to poison the water. Is that what they do? They, absolutely. You know, or they're cutting out people's tongues because they've been talking to, to Westerners. You, know, you look at the need for protection at a local level of, of civilians who are engaged in a, a conflict they don't want to be part of. You know, definitely there is a need, uh, uh, was a need in the, at least in the short term to, to step in and to provide some support for people who are caught up in conflict unnecessarily. The strategic objectives, I think there's a, you know, it's a, it's a fairly uh, well-trodden path to say, have the strategic objectives been met? Um, that's very, that's very questionable, I'd say. Um, yeah. You know, and is the is the the Taliban now on the ascendancy again? Quite possibly. Is that sort of defeating the whole purpose of why we went in the first place? Quite possibly. But definitely on a human level, when I was there, certainly on a human level, am I glad I went? Am I proud to have taken part in? operations and, and support efforts and influence operations that, that made a constructive difference on the ground? Yes, I, I definitely am. Yeah. yeah, I have maximum respect for all the people who served out there. I'm not dissing what they did. Mm. And I, I think, I just think as a, as a father of sons, I wouldn't like the idea that my boys mm. were sent out to essentially mow the lawn, uh, go, go on these pointless bloody suicide patrols, basically, like, like the one that I think the Welsh Guards got taken out very heavily on, um, was it Rupert Thornlow, I think that was the, th this was wrong. You cannot get people to join your armed forces and then let them down in that way. Uh, certainly, I think there was a, a, a certain feeling out there that, and maybe it's still the case now, that the, the armed services weren't getting the support that they needed either in public opinion or actually in financial and necessary equipment support. Um, I don't think there's any... 
uh, contention yes, they had their in shit, saying that. They had shit equipment, didn't they? Those, in the those, start. Yeah, in the those start, vehicles yeah. that didn't protect them at all. Yeah, in the start, certainly, yeah. And, and this is a live issue now. I mean, you're seeing it with the, with the current Defence Secretary at the moment turning around saying he wants two billion more and, and an awful lot of people saying, yes, the, the armed forces need more money. You know, they need, need more support if they're going to be sent off to war. Now, the problem you've then got is, is the exchequer and, and the fact of do you give it to the NHS, do you give it to the military, How, you know, what kind of wars Duh. are we fighting? It's a no-brainer for me, Sven. I'm <laughs> yeah, but there's different ways of doing it. I mean, this is all predicated on the idea that you need to take kinetic action, physical interventions to affect peace. What, what I come from a slightly different position, which is, look, if we haven't got the money uh, as a nation to pay our armed services, the kind of funds that we may want to, you know, yeah. well then we have to be a bit more savvy and we have to find different ways to affect our, our strategic objectives, our tactical objectives as a nation. And that leans you then more towards influence operations. They're, they're more cost effective and, and arguably more effective. And if you can win the hearts and minds and get people to come on a journey with you towards peace or towards uh, engagement, then you don't have to fight them anyway. So, no. so sort of, you know, there is a different way of doing this and that's more engagement-based, dialogue-based. I'm totally, I, and can I say I admire the way you sort of brought the conversation around there to your pet topic, which I was, going to, I was going to do anyway, actually, to be fair. You were there as a psyops expert, weren't you? Well, whether or not expert, I was there as a, was a psyops, psyops practitioner. I, mean, yes. I, I just love that word, <laughs> psyops. Yes. Psychological operations, is that what it means? Yeah, it doesn't actually exist anymore. I mean, psyops has actually been phased out by the British military. It's now, what? Yeah, yeah, no, psyops has been sort of... What I was a part of was something called 15 UK PSYOPs, uh, which was a, 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 a regiment, a team, a unit, which is now folded into something else called 77 Brigade. So PSYOPs as a word I don't think actually exists in the British military anymore. Oh, right. It's all part of a wider influence operations. Uh, Maybe it sounds too American or something. I think it just confused people. I think they were calling it psych cops. They, it sounds as though it's in, in implicitly sort of dark arts, where actually it's, it's a bit simpler than that you know um so yeah no psyops I, I don't think is a is common parlance anymore can you give me some examples of psyops and i mean the kind of stuff you were doing i, I don't want you to give away our secrets mm -hmm. obviously but mm -hmm. i mean there's similar stuff you can tell me well i think the intent of psyops certainly when i was serving which was to undermine the will of the enemy or to yeah. win over the 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 commitment of the uncommitted or to strengthen the commitment of the committed. Okay, so if you start there, yeah. so if it's tier one Taliban, the people who are really the, the main people who are causing the aggression, that are uh, subjugating the people and also fighting to ISAF, you know, to undermine their will to fight. Okay, well, that might be by um, directly messaging them with leaflets or radio or whatever it may be um, to, to question the motivations of why they're actually doing what they're doing and if they really are acting in the best interests of either their religion or their sociological factors that they're, they're saying. Um, winning over the commitment of the, uh, of the uncommitted might be tier two. So these are the people who aren't necessarily wanting to follow the Taliban, but haven't really got much of a choice. You know, they, they may be uh, growing crops and, and are, are forced to grow opium, or they are, yeah. um, their child is taken into prostitution to pay debts, and the only way of getting their child back from the Taliban, who's essentially selling their child for prostitution, is to then grow opium for them and, and then pay back the debt. You know, these are very complicated things that needed to be messaged against. Now, that's not something that a bullet is going to solve. That's about key leader engagement, engaging with tribal elders in the shuras, about putting messaging out there to give alternatives to, to getting themselves in that position in the first place. Um, and then supporting the committed, the people who are actually realizing that ISAF in that case are actually trying to do some good and who they are, what's their mandate, why are they there, um, and, and how to stay out of the, of the, of the trouble areas no, so as not to get sucked into the conflict. You know. Presumably the tier two people, the best line of argument is if you stick with us, we're not going to let you get got by the Taliban and we're not going to let you down. Is that kind of the thing? And that can be a problem now with some of our well, actions consequently. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, this is where you, you, know, you, you must walk the talk. Um, now, there's many instances I know of where the, the, that was done by ISAF, you know, which is, you know, if you, if, if you engage with ISAF, there is sort of betterment and there is a, an infrastructure that can be built and there is schooling, there is education and, and, and so forth. Obviously, in the long term, if we want to keep our credibility in the region, though, that yeah. has to be sustained. And if, if, and if anything we do wrong, we or ISAF do wrong, is exploited 
uh, as a messaging opportunity by the Taliban, they will be identifying every single opportunity. Well, quite, well ultimately, it's not up to you whether the promises are honoured, is it? You're just a no. kind of a grunt on the front line yes. doing the PSYOPs thing. Yeah. Um, you must have said stuff that that has not been fulfilled, and you must feel a bit shit about... Sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, mm, I don't want to make mm, you feel mm. guilty, but... We really would try not to, and, and the the advice, and I don't want to overstate my role. I mean, obviously, I had uh, much more senior people out there who were who were taking these decisions. But um, you know, the one of the principles of psyops uh, uh, in terms of the training is you know credible, timely, accountable information that's that demonstrably then delivered. I mean, part of a good information operations cell. What they're doing to, to the commander is making sure that they advise the commander that whatever he says or she says can then be, be fulfilled and the consequences of not doing that. So certainly at a tactical level, uh, it was rare not to deliver against the, the claim or the promise. At a more strategic level over, over a period of time now, that's probably questionable, isn't it? Yeah. So the tier one, who are in a way the most interesting, because mm-hmm. how do you deal with these people? And I read something fascinating uh, I think from a previous interview you gave, where the thing that the tier one Taliban fear most is not death, but being captured. Is mm. that right? There was uh, Operation Bad Zuka. So we were tasked with helping. There was a, a several hundred tier one Taliban who were entrenched in a in a position in, in southern Afghanistan um, and had been surrounded by ISAF. And the inevitable consequence was to get them to put down their weapons was going to involve, you know, a very significant battle um, of, of kind of going in. They were entrenched. They had uh, uh, mortar positions. They were wanting a battle. And we were given the opportunity to message them for, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours before what was otherwise going to be an It's going to be like Okinawa or something. Well, it was going to be certainly a serious uh, loss of life on both sides, potentially. Yeah. And in fact, what, what it took to make them put down their weapons was simply, what, what normally happens is you, is you will fly over them with a helicopter and drop leaflets saying, look, tomorrow we're coming to either bomb or attack this area, put down your weapons and, and walk away. Yeah. And quite often, let's say in, a, in Iraq, that was a very successful campaign because you have a, a, a demotivated a group of people who don't want to be there fighting anyway. You know, and if it given the opportunity to surrender, walk off the battlefield, walk away and, and live to fight another day or go That's and, conscripts in a regular army. Yeah, yeah. Sort of. now, with the Taliban tier one, that was different. They weren't, you know, you could you could drop as many leaflets saying we're coming to bomb or to fight tomorrow, and they'd be saying, right, bring it on, let's let's have the, the fight. Yeah. Um, instead, what we did was was found out from intelligence they were much more fearful of being taken to Guantanamo. So all it took really was just putting leaflets uh, down onto them, which was, you know, we're not coming to kill you, we're coming to capture you. And put you in an orange jumpsuit. Exactly, and put a picture of that on there, and then did suddenly you? they they put their weapons down and walked off the battlefield. Now. You know, there's a moral line there in terms of exact uh, representation of the, the, the facts and so forth, but what certainly can be assessed based on the available evidence of, of post the event, you know, we were watching them put down their weapons and walk off the battlefield. Yeah. Oh, sorry, um, I'm tapping the table. Yes, yeah, you yeah. are. You're tapping the table. <laughs> Despite my psyops you, you attempts were, you were, to, to clear your mind, <laughs> yeah, my clear instruction, what are you doing? You must be <laughs> tier one. You, you must be one of the tricky ones. So, um, how, what is it that, did you establish what they most fear about going to Guantanamo? Um, yes, there, were, there, was, there was intelligence that was feeding our decision to go with that campaign. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of it and where that came from, but, but yes, no, there but, was quite clear. But, but was, it, was, it, was it they didn't like the jumpsuits or they didn't like the, the being denied martyrdom? Yes, I think or, it was a combination of, the, the, obviously, yes, being denied martyrdom. They were there prepared to die and, and not wanted to die, but very happy to take as many of us with them as possible. Yes. Uh, and would have therefore secured their... Uh, eternity and their families, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle in in the present as well. Because yes. the, the family would have been paid money by the Taliban as as martyrs dying in with honour. You know. So the same applies as it does with Hamas and an organisation. I mean, and, and like the Iranians, I think do the yes. same, don't they? You yes. get rewarded for martyrdom. Yes. Yeah. So you're fighting some quite quite motivated people. Normally, yes. If they're if they're part of you know tier one Taliban or part of a terrorist organisation, they're going to be fairly motivated. Yeah. Okay. So you are out in Afghanistan, or even Iraq, and you've been captured by Jihadi John. Now, I mean, or somebody of that ilk. Okay. Now he's got that cold, completely dead look in in his eyes. You, he's seen he's seen so much bad shit. He's killed so many people. How are you? going to penetrate that and get through to him in a way that's going to find him persuasive? 
Okay, first of all, let, let's separate it from me being captured and, and all the rest and just deal with it as a piece of sort of psychology. Anyone that's gone on the path to become radicalized yeah. has therefore accepted information in that's been delivered by someone in a step-by-step -step process that's made them more and more radical and there's been, you know, arguments have been presented to them and, and their sense of disaffection has been exploited to the point at which they've reached an endpoint where they feel as though violence is their only option, violence is their only alternative, okay? By the very fact that they've gone through that step-by-step -step process, you can then understand the radicalization process and if you sort of assess it almost as a science, you can work out then where are the points at which you can intervene, what, what are the conversations you could have with that person to make them step back from the brink, from the precipice. And even the most committed person, it doesn't matter if they're a committed smoker or a committed Christian or a committed, it, doesn't, it can be anything, you know, a committed person who's uh, fearful of spiders, you know. If, you're, if your brain is committed towards something irrational, Rational arguments can be presented to bring it back from that brink because you've got a, a, an irrational response to a rational stimulus. Yeah? So we demonstrated that with, with a campaign we did called uh, Not Another Brother, uh, which was a viral campaign we did online for um, a charity, I think you know Majid Nawaz, uh, yes. you wrote about him recently. So about Quilliam. Yeah, Quilliam, yeah. 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 So Majid uh, approached us and said, look, can we intervene um, online to stop the radicalization of Muslim youth in this country? Oh, yeah. And again, so what we did there was look at the way in which people were being radicalized online, what was the messaging that was being used to take them from people who were not considering this at all to the point at which they were literally at the point of getting kinetic, at getting committed to committing violence, and designed an online intervention campaign called Not Another Brother that was then shared in their networks and would help them step back from the precipice. And that was considered I think I'm right in saying it's sort of widely considered as the most successful online campaign that's ever been done against radicalization. And that was really going to people who were committed and wanting to go abroad to fight against this country. And, um, you know, I, I think it had half a billion media impressions in that's the first seven days. It had people writing. in seven days. I think so, Goodness. yeah. It was, it was absolutely phenomenal. And, and um, it also, what was exciting by it is that people were reaching out to charities, though, who we were putting it in networks where people were being radicalized, and instead then of listening to the siren's voice of the people who are radicalizing them, they were in fact going over to the charities that were also in that space saying, I, I'm fearful I'm being radicalized, help, you know, and I'm, I'm making contact with you to get me out of this cycle, you know. So it, it can be done, and it is, it is possible to do so even... So how did you um, get the video out there into the right circles? Do you, you put it on Facebook groups of Al-Qaeda and stuff? And yes, I mean, and right. assess their, what you call node analysis. We, so you, you do a sort of a, a mapping of all the different influence structures online, where these people are being approached and who's approaching them and how they're being approached. Yeah. And then you, you introduce your material into that network. You but know. Wouldn't, they, wouldn't they see this stuff and know it's from the other side and go, I'm not watching this shat, shatan or whatever they call him. Shatan is, is putting this stuff out. Yes, you, you, you have to... Um, well, in, in, in this particular case, what we did was actually put it out unbranded for the first few days. Yeah. Oh, so it, start, it looked initially like a, yes. another recruitment video. People, people thought they were watching a recruitment video to yeah. start with, yeah. Now, obviously, it caused an awful lot of controversy within the, the recruitment networks. You know, an awful lot of people got very hostile towards it. That actually worked in our favour. That made it more attractive for people to watch they wanted to hear what was being Look discussed. at this disgusting Exactly, piece look, of look at this piece of nonsense and all the rest. And of course people, but we, we created it in such a way as then it was really appealing though to really underlying psychological principles to do with risk and reward, which is hopefully through the video questioning uh, what they were being told and being able to see it in a new way, that then it didn't matter what other people then turned around and said or the recruiters were saying, no, don't listen to this stuff. The more they said that, the more they were falling into the trap of the video. You know? Right, right. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my, I think we'll agree, really, really interesting special guest, Sven Hughes. More in a moment. Hey folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with AWR Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week, every week, and guest columnists like Gun Owners of America's Larry Pratt or Armed American Radio's Mark Walters. Also features a review of a firearm or a firearm accessory each week. The newsletter downloads on Thursday, comes right to your email inbox. You can subscribe at Breitbart.com backslash AWR. 
This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool. And um, I think we can agree, very fascinating ex army psyops guest, Sven Hughes of Verbalization, uh, who's, who's pushing to, to the commercial use if you like, the skills that he learned while seeing the elephant fighting the Taliban and outwitting them, which I think is pretty cool. And I, I, like, I like the idea that you're building a career after the army. I, I like the idea that our boys having risked, uh, and girls, having risked their lives can then make some money out of it. I think it's really good. Well, hopefully not just make some money, but continue to do some good. And save the world as well. Yeah, 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 Yeah. that goes. I mean, let's be very clear with the Not Another Brother project we're just talking about. We made no money whatsoever. It was we were helping to finance that, you know, so it's not just about making money. Britain has a really important opportunity uh, at the moment. We're very successful, sort of the Mayfair set in the late 60s, you know, uh, Goldsmith and and David Sterling and, and so forth, selling and exporting arms, kinetic warfare. Okay, morally, just park aside the morals of that for a second, but that really helped build the British economy leading to Thatcherism. We have an opportunity now with both our marketing industry, with our influence capabilities, our our political campaigning capabilities. We have a, a vast amount of talent in this country, which if we can package soft power and, and yeah. influence effectively now, prior to Brexit, and really work collectively and, and make this an industry to be proud of, and morally responsible, ethically, you know, legally doing the right things and so forth, but also commercialising it, yes. You know, we have one of the most extraordinary things to take us through Brexit and, and post-Brexit to sell to the world. And we should be, yeah. you know, and yes, a lot of people in uniform at the moment should be uh, hopefully a part of that. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm really glad you're doing this. I'm, I'm, excited, I'm excited by your project. Later on, we're going to talk about Trump. We're going to mm. talk about Brexit. And we're going to talk about how to deprogram Greens, I think. I, I might try that one on you. But I haven't exhausted this whole Taliban jihadist thing yet. Can you just tell me a bit more about what is it they're after? Presumably one of the things, they want to be the baddest mothers in town, don't they? I mean, that's the thing about gang warfare generally. You want to be in the, the gang that goes harder than everyone else. And there's no question that ISIS, part of their appeal, is that they do shit that everyone else is appalled by. Is, 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 that, is that your sense, that people want to be part of that? That's a fairly simplistic way of looking at it. I mean, there are... With some of the work we've done for, for particular clients, you know, we, we've specified at least six main motivators that can help. If you, if you talk to people on those subjects who are currently radicalised, yeah. you can help walk them back from the precipice. Now, one of those groups are certainly the absolute ultra-violent, so committed, you know, it's almost you know, a sociopathic degree of violence. That's the hardest group to hit, yeah? But, but around them, actually, an awful lot of other motivations. Now, it may be alienation, a sense of disaffection. It may be a sense of uh, misrepresentation of their religion. It may be a sense of, you know, there are different motivations there. Not all of them are just out-and-out you know, beyond the pale crazies who can't be spoken to, you know. And that's that's the trick, is working out where are the, the routes by which they will engage in dialogue over division. And can you start a dialogue with these people on any subject and then from that build out? Now, that's no different if the provisional IRA or in, in Bosnia for, for the various groups there or, or any, any uh, conflict. At the end of the day, it's only ever going to be solved by people sitting around a table and starting to talk. Um, that's one thing that, that history has taught us. So we've got to work harder to find those bridges into those conversations, even with very unpalatable people, because inevitably peace is going to rely on that. Yeah, OK, but I'm going to press you on this one, because everything I've read about the profile of the kind of people who are drawn to jihadism, that they normally go through a stage where they're the hedonistic stage where they get involved in drugs and stuff and they go club they go clubbing and suddenly they acquire this kind of sense of purposelessness and they want to blame the surround I mean actually tell me that how much do you think that kind of bien pensant liberal kind of the, the sense of our culture the sort of hatred of our culture that you read in the guardian all the time how much do you think of that feeds into radicalism there are 
Okay, we've got to be careful not to just be black and white about this, and we, let's talk about the Guardian sort of separately. But let's leave them out. Okay, of this we can play the BBC I mean, as well. Yeah. I mean, we, we yeah, no, but I think we've got to be really of... careful that we mustn't be glib with this. This is sort of really serious stuff, and it's it, we've got to be careful not to fall into that trap. I think Roger Scruton was really interesting on this actually uh, in some of his writing in terms of that the second generation disaffection, the first generation, um, uh, you know. Uh, that, that second generation disaffection he was talking about Algeria uh, uh, Algerians within in uh, uh, France and I think he was describing certainly stuff that can be evidenced through the psychological factors that we see which is that that reappraisal of of okay we've we've we're coming into a society we want to be part of a society first generation but the second generation then turning around saying well I still don't yet feel fully integrated in this society, therefore there are friction points. And then uh, the siren's voices of people turning around saying those friction points are demonstrations that the society is against you. I don't think that's a fair representation of what's actually going on. Um, and that can be exploited for bad. And we've got to be very careful on our communities that we don't allow that to happen. And that's therefore the majority of a country have to be the ones that reach into these communities and say, no, you don't need to feel disaffected. We're here. Let's start the conversation. Yeah. Does that answer your question? No, yeah. it doesn't no. really. It, it kind of com Muddles completely it. skirted round, that w okay. which is, it seems to me that one of the problems we have in Western civilization at the yeah. moment is that, call it 50% of the, the sort of media influencers are pumping out this image of Western civilization as being corrupt, flawed, decadent, wrong. And this gives people in is Islamic communities all the all the stuff that well look, if they're saying it, if 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 kind of white intellectuals are saying this stuff, it kind of must be true because they wouldn't be saying it otherwise, would they? Yeah. Well, that, look, there's, there's no question, from my personal perspective, yeah. is a lot of the manufactured rage yeah. of the left media, yeah. is it helpful or unhelpful to our society as a whole? Unhelpful. Yeah. Could you argue, therefore, there are connections between radicalisation? I mean, I think that would be a step that you'd need, need to back up. Right. Personally, when I look at the manufactured rage that's going on at the moment within certain areas of the media, yes, unhelpful. And I don't think it's even liberal anymore, is it? I mean, if you look, there's censorship happening with, with from, from this sort of controlling left. Well, that's not liberal. You no. know, there's, there's group dynamics of using group mentality. Well, that's not liberal. Yeah. There's uh, underpinning notions of violence, even John McDonald threatening for, you know, intimating of violence through as a, a political force. Well, that's not liberal. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a, a great deal of supposed liberal values, which have nothing to do with liberal values that are being exploited by the left, I mean, in a very controlling way. Yeah. Um, that definitely worries me. I mean, I think it's why Trump is getting an awful lot of bad press. I mean, there's no question the, the migrant issue at the moment with, with children has not played well at all, but he's certainly not getting... Except, from except... Well, now we know that that time photograph was was not was, true. Was exactly, not it's a haunted own family. Yeah, exactly. This is manufactured rage. Yeah, you know? yeah, and absolutely. And we should call it out everywhere. And that that's uh, we should call it out on the right and the left. I mean, manufactured rage is too easy. We have a, a very. It's too easy to sing the, the the devil's song at the moment, and and social media enables that to happen very fast. Accountability, truthfulness, uh, you know, ethics, really good old fashioned values. The more we can um, take pride in that and, and for companies that work in the influence space, the more that they can be credited for promoting those, hopefully that becomes the new benchmark no. in this space. You know? It's good. Oh, look, I'm, I'm really glad, glad that we're on the same team because um, I, I want a psyop specialist acting in my interests rather than against them. So that's good. Before we, we say goodbye to the Taliban, we're talking about the different routes where you reach them. But if somebody believes fundamentally that what goes on in this life is pretty much irrelevant you know as long as you kind of pray five times a day and, and you do the you know you follow the tenets of the quran and the hadith um what really matters is after because allah allah decides and, and and it's ultimately that that counts how somebody's somebody's been out to syria or or iraq and done terrible terrible things they've crucified people they've raped women they've, they've killed people what way back is, is there for them? How do you get, how do you say, well, actually, you know, there's still a chance to, what, what do you do? Okay, well, the, the two points there. First of all, you can intervene 
much earlier before they believe that their only option is to go to the afterlife. Right. You, know, you can increase the value of today in the current life. And that's where things like, you know, fate, when we did fate, Families Against Terrorism and Extremism, was very much enabling parents to have the conversation with their children around the dinner table. And that was incredibly effective, you know, and enabling that to happen in the familial moment, that yeah. in itself can counteract much of the messaging that's going to these people to make them feel as though they don't have hope, you know. So the first thing is to intervene there with credible, in community messaging that's as good and sophisticated as anything that's coming uh, from the other side because it is sophisticated what's coming from the other side and making the families more enfranchised and enabled to have those conversations okay, well, sort, of, one. sort of teaching them that like your wife and your kids are wonderful things and you should appreciate them you, or the way that the, the messaging if you look up not another brother after this online the video that we made there was all about someone who had gone abroad perhaps Syria was the, the location and it was actually the the consequences to their family of what they'd done and what they caused their family back home and their brother and that's why it's called not another brother you know and it's it, it's a letter from his brother that the person who's gone abroad is now reading in this godforsaken place where he's facing the the romance of going off to fight doesn't live up to the to the right. promise, yeah, yeah, and so that's a much much stronger bond than people give it credit for. It, okay. it isn't, you know, and so you really can work with that and bring people back from the precipice. Now, look, if people have then got to the point at which they have committed violent acts and and and. Ex extremely violent acts and so forth, then you're into a whole different space. You know, then you're into a much, much more one-to-one -one engagement space. What can you do with that person? Yes, of course you can engage with them and, and so forth. Well, are they going to face prosecution? Most most likely. If they continue on that, that course of action, are they going to end up uh, at the end of a barrel of a gun? Most likely. But if they do kind of come in from the cold and want to engage and have the commitment to step away from this life that they've chosen for themselves, we should be there um, as part of our, our offering and holding them to account, of course, in terms of the law and so forth, but yeah. part of the offering would be to then to de-radicalize them and maybe enable them to talk to other people about the mistakes that they made and, and what the realities are actually like. They become incredibly important as amplifiers of, of a reality that most people aren't seeing. They're being sold the hype, but hearing from someone who's actually been there and done it and has chosen to step away can be very, very compelling. You know, former combatants are, are actually a very good mouthpiece to tell the truth. Yes, you know. of course. I understand that you are the, one of the special friends. In fact, you are the special friend. So we know there's only one special friend of this podcast. Only one person ever listens to this. As you know, one of the themes of this podcast is how do we win the culture wars? How do we save Western civilization? from that side of the argument which lies vilifies just regularly i mean the left plays really dirty in a, in a way i don't think that right whatever you want to call it libertarian conservatarian classical liberal those of us that the broad church on the free market side of the argument we don't play low in the same way that, that they do and i was now i've got you Tell me. I mean, for example, the Greens. I've spent the last 15 years of my life on bloody Groundhog Day fighting these people. And I know that all the evidence is on my side because, like, when you reduce things down, down to the basic principles, you know, you, you find that, yeah, the facts are on your side. But nevertheless, there's a very, very powerful Green blob churning out propaganda. Or, or name any other, other category. I mean, in the field of education, there's a very powerful industry trying to destroy the, the reforms proposed by people like Michael Gove and Toby Young, all the good, good work they do. So how do we win the war? Okay, it's a very, sorry, very big, big question. question. Yeah, 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 sorry. Okay, let's, let's keep it in politics for a second, yeah. just before we go to other things such as green issues. Mm. Facts, at the end of the day, win out. So if it, let's take Trump and, 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 and Brexit as two of the topics. Yeah, here. that's okay. Your <laughs> okay, so Trump, at the end of the day, you know, you, you're talking about a 3.8% um, uh, unemployment. You're talking about 21% tax. You're talking about lowest uh, Hispanic um, unemployment in at least 20 years, possibly, of all time. Yeah. Lowest black unemployment, perhaps, of all time. You're talking about the Iran deal, which is now uh, turning the corner, perhaps, on that issue. You're talking about, you know, Kim Jong-un and what's happened in Singapore. In this case, the left is absolutely 
kibosh because they thought the midterms were going to fall completely into their lap. And actually, people will make their own decision, assess based on the evidence. You know, so you've got to trust the audience. If you just put the facts out, and in, in his case, Trump has got a program that is very, very clear that everyone understands, which is America first and let's make America great again, but that principle of America first, there's no equivocation. And i you know, fairly confident he's going to do much better in the midterms than people expect, and he'll go on and win the 2020. What we're not doing very well with Brexit, and perhaps the arguments, uh, you know, then is what could we learn from that in terms of Brexit? The clarity of the programme isn't there. The clarity of what we're trying to achieve isn't there, other than, yes, we want... Brexit, you know, but the the day after Brexit isn't painted in people's minds. The motivation of what's in it for them isn't isn't uh, painted in their minds. There's no sense they can kind of understand from a coping and edging point of view. They're they're coping and they're edging every day. They 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 they're just struggling on at the moment, and now they've got another problem ahead of them. You know, we've got to more effectively, with facts to substantiate it communicate the possibilities and the opportunities of Brexit. And that's got to come from the top, that's got to come from May, and it's it's an awful lot of work. Dream what, on. Uh, well, uh, you know, Hunt was <laughs> right, which is a good backer at the moment. You know, think, but, but you know, the Don, Dominic Greaves of this world, he didn't get his way the other day in Parliament. You know, the the fact is that that's gone through from the Lords now to, to, to the, the other House and then back again and so forth. They're not winning. They're not winning. Yes. You know, uh, um, so... Hold okay. firm, I think, is really, and just um, base it on the facts. I see exactly what you're saying, and as Margaret Thatcher said, the facts of life are conservative. And you, and you look at that. You look, at, you read my hero Thomas Sowell, people like that. And you just realise it's just like we're on the right side. We're not the bad guys. We really, we, it's not like that um, that sketch where are we the bad guys? But in a way, your answer to the Brexit problem is, as I understand it. We need Donald Trump in the UK because it's not about the message, really. It's about about the people brave enough to be able to it's deliver the, the message. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? The the the, um, the American ambassador to the UK saying, "Stop whining about Brexit and actually start talking about the opportunities." To, to, to paraphrase, yeah. you know, I, I'm certainly looking for as a as a business owner, but also as an individual, as a conservative myself. You know, I'm looking for the wonderful feeling and opportunity of Brexit that I'm looking forward to as a business owner. Yeah. And what I'm seeing in the press every day is, okay, there's now another. You know, the, I'm not even going to say the name of it, but you know, we've we've heard the uh, the aerospace industry with their point of view over overnight. You know, we we hear so many negative comments. It would be, I can't wait. For, for Brexit. I can't wait as a business owner yeah, yeah. To, to be given free market opportunity to give the best service, the best products and compete at the best price with anyone in the world. You yeah. know? And that's a fabulous thing without all the rigging of the you know, European Union in the way and so forth. I can't wait for that. You know, where is that voice in business? It's certainly not in the media at the moment. Where is that no. voice in politics in those terms? taking that mandate to the people, saying, this can be great, but we have to muck in together and we have to actually remember what it is to be British and now brand that and commercialise that and sell it to the world in a, in a really constructive way. I'm with you. I've, I've already sensed there that what the third section of the podcast is going to be like, what we're going to talk about. But before springing that thrill on you, I wanted to ask a bit more about what it is that makes Donald Trump's messaging so godlike and fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may invite you to do that, he's, uh, he keeps it simple. I mean, he understands his target audience. Um, he has basically worked out the real drivers of his audience, which is, you know, and Steve Bannon was right when he said this, which is the only poll you need to care about is that 70 something percent of the people don't feel as though America's great anymore. You know, and he's, that was his advice yeah. to Trump right at the beginning. Forget all the other polls, that is the one to speak to, which is if you can make people feel emboldened and proud. And, and feel as though therefore they're passing something on to the next generation that they can get behind and so forth. That in itself is a brilliant piece of messaging. That, that's actually something I've used before in a, an election campaign with a campaign called It's Working, where there was a sort of change message being brought by the opposition. I was advising a prime minister just saying, look, go with the message, it's working, and just talk to the things that are working and let's, let's drown them with cream. Let's, let's you know, just speak to the positive and build people around that rather than all this... this nonsense negative you know that's what Trump understood now you're still going to have the negative voices but there comes a point at which is do you want to be the kind of person that supports and backs betterment 
prosperity, opportunity, or do you want to be on the sidelines just whinging about everything? And what he's managed to do, perhaps, is crystallise, or in the process of doing, is crystallising that positive centre space which says, you may not like me as an individual, but what I stand for is, and I can back it up with the facts, which is, as we go through female employment, black employment, Hispanic employment, taxation, and so forth, I can stand by the betterment that is being felt in all areas of our society. Yes. That is a very, is that marketing genius? No, that's just, it's just a very clear, simple, effective messaging strategy that comes back to one single principle, which is America first. Yeah. You know, and that's very, very difficult to achieve. I mean, we're all throwing stones, everyone's throwing stones at, at, at Trump, but they should have a go at trying to do that with a messaging campaign. If most, if most commercial companies manage to get the simplicity of his messaging across so many different areas and so many different topics, they'd be up for every award going. Isn't it more of a challenge? I mean, there's that music industry phrase, you can't polish a turd. Isn't, in a, in a way, it much, much easier for conservatives? For you to be a kind of conservative, sympathetic messaging guy, your job's so much easier because you can say, look at the facts. Whereas if you're on the left, I mean, if you were, if you were advising Hillary, for example, what would you have said? Uh, retire. Don't stand. Yeah. Um, look, first of all, you, you've got a, a, an assumption in there, it's easy at the moment in any way labelling yourself and conservative is not easy at the moment. It feels as though it's the pariah uh, label. You and know, always has been, I think. It's terribly sad, really, actually. because It's really sad to see because it's actually the, the, the notion of conservative being to conserve the things that we value. And, and so forth. It's a, I would say at the moment, going through Brexit, it's a really important thing. That's not about building borders and, and rejecting people from coming in and all the ways in which it's, it's, it's represented. It's actually about branding Britain for what it's really good at and saying come and be a part of that and, and, and enjoy it for what we have here and it's really good and come be a part of it that's fine and we're globally engaged and so forth but but let's just be clear that's what we're really good at and that's what we want to move forward with you know um, so being conservative at the moment is a, a heck of a, a difficult thing not least because of the way in which perhaps it's it's being represented from the top I mean it's not exactly an attractive proposition at the moment from the top no, um, it's not we're living through a few years where the brand is all over the place Despite that, you know, we carry on. Um, in terms of Hillary, what would you say to Hillary? Uh, in all seriousness, someone should have told her much earlier on uh, the toxicity of her brand. She, yeah. she clearly, or her advisors, weren't listening to the, the reality. Yes. Or you should have said maybe, maybe a spell behind bars would do you good, <laughs> good Hillary. Um, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Sven Hughes. More in a moment. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Why did we see some of the Republican kissing of Mark Zuckerberg that was taking place? I called it kissing the ring because I felt like every single person practically had to kiss the ring of this guy, you know, who wants to do nothing except get all those people out of office. So, you know, bizarre, bizarre behavior from the Republicans. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Sven Hughes of Verbalization. Now, I said I'd worked out where the next bit was going to go. And I suppose it's that question of, you said that the facts are what you need to win and that I agree with you up to a point, but at the same time, we're not winning. We're not winning bigly at the moment. I mean, in America, they're winning bigly. I think under Trump, but because they've got the Donald, we haven't got the Donald. We've got Jacob Rees-Mogg, but at the moment, he's on the he's on the on the fringes. I mean, I th I think he could be our Trump if he if he if he were given half the chance, but we've got this fundamental problem, which is that our media culture is really swings towards the. The liberal left. I, I mean, you know, even, even if you allow for the Sun and the, and the Mail, you've got the, the BBC dominant narrative, you've got the Guardian Easters, and although they're not representative of where people are at large, which is why we, we had Brexit, the fact is that they are controlling the narrative. So how do you bypass those in a world where you've got Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, um, you name them, all censoring conservative voices. How do we how do we get past this? I, th I think we've got to be really careful, though. We don't become just whinging um, 
uh, in, in our view of this, sort of saying, oh, it's the media's fault because they're not covering us. The, the bottom line is, at the moment, conservatism hasn't made its central brand attractive enough. It hasn't communicated the benefits of free market economics. It hasn't communicated that there can be such a thing as responsible capitalism. It hasn't communicated the reason why people should be proud to associate it with a philosophy. You know, the liberal left does not have, or the liberals and then the controlling left, does not really have fundamentally a philosophy that actually um, stands up to the light of day, I would argue, in the way in which conservatism does. Conservatives, modern conservatives at the moment, as represented perhaps by number 10 at the moment, but is not putting its best foot forward and arguing its own case in an attractive way. Yeah. And that's our responsibility. That's not the, the, the media's responsibility there to give us fair coverage. Uh, you get fair coverage by making your proposition so attractive people want to talk about it and have such talk value in the pubs and, and clubs of, of this country that they believe in it and want it in their lives. Yeah. Now that's exactly what happened with Brexit with the beer mats, where, where Matthew Elliott did a piece of genius, I think it was Matthew's uh, idea who was, who was organising the uh, one aspect of the Brexit campaign, which was the beer mats in the Brexit campaign in Weatherspoon pubs, which is, look, that's where the real people are yes. who are going to vote, Yeah. Okay. and they're going to sit and have a conversation in groups of five or six people, so the most cost-effective way to start a conversation amongst them Brilliant. is to brand the beer mats. Don't do television. Don't do press. Yes. Don't do all the standard ways of talking to people. Take your proposition, make it attractive to them, make it relevant to them, and put it in their life. Now, if conservatism could do that, if it could take a little bit of that spirit, then we won't have to have all this whining, life's unfair because I'm a, a, a Tory. It's like, no, 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 just, you know, it's just like Thatcherism to some extent. You know, Thatcher made the person who owned a garage believe that they could own two garages and made the person who was working, you know, that is the responsibility of the Tories at the moment and no one else. You know, now where is that voice coming from? Okay, perhaps it's Rhys Mogg. I'm struggling for many other voices that are going to appeal beyond the Westminster bubble, though. No. Apparently, I heard the other day, Liz Truss is surprisingly good and sound. I didn't know that. I, I apparently she's... I, I might, might get it. Mind you, I've got this policy at the moment of not getting cabinet people, senior conservatives on the podcast, because they just, they're all on message. Well, this is it. And, and, and this is, now, where's the new uh, Roger Scruton? Where's the new, you know, where's the new thinking about... Hello? Yeah, yeah, Hello? Yeah, oh, my God. Yeah, sorry, of course. I, mean, I, feel, I feel so offended. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know. I, I, I haven't got the Roger Scruton rule. But, but, you know, there has to be a new energy put into this that, that there is the new conservative solutions to the new modern world are more effective than the cultural Marxism, the arguments that we're facing from the other side. Look, you know. Anne Coulter did a Breitbart town hall on this and she said, look, the internet is fundamentally right wing in as much as the facts, when they boil down to what, what's true and what's not true, the conservatives got the facts and, and the left haven't, yeah. therefore the internet will win, which is why you've got Silicon Valley putting all these, demonetizing, for example. Yeah. Aren't you involved in a project to do with that? How to enable conservative sites to bypass this project? No, you're not. No, no. You should be, mate. No. <laughs> Please, get on with it. Work yeah. out that. But it comes back, it comes back to the, the, the fresh thinking in the conservative party, more generally conservative thinking, yeah. can be the tonic for all the coping and edging and cynicism that's going on in our, in our society at the moment. If you think about it, you look at sport, Drugs, corruption. You look at uh, policing, uh, lots of people accusing it of being you know, corrupt and, 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 and all the rest of it. You look at um, uh, banks, you know, risico banking, you know, out of control banking. You look at the media, you know, people questioning the motivations of the media. If it isn't our politics that provides an attractive solution to this, well, we might as well give up on politics. If it isn't now that the time, solution. well, that's, and that's sadly what might happen is that people just turn around and say, actually, you haven't come up with a new answer that's relevant for the modern world, so a plague on all your houses. Would, that would be a really terrible thing if yeah, that happens. I think you probably agree with me that actually it's about time the Conservatives started talking about less government. Yes. I mean, that would, yep. be, that would be a yeah. very and, good and, start. And is it by any stretch of the imagination why Trump cut through? Because he turned around and said, I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman, I'm not interested in the swamp of vested interests and status quo. That's what Hillary represents, and that's why you shouldn't vote for her. And I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. And sure as hell, in the last week or two, he certainly made mistakes. You know, 
but people are still going with him because it's like, yes, but at least you've got a core program, a core belief, which is, you know, that notion of the art of the deal. It goes right back to his autobiography there, which is, yeah. he made it pretty clear what he was about then. He hasn't really changed at all. You kind of know what you're going to get. And I can't say that's true at the moment with the Conservative Party. Yes. And that's a shame. No. That's a great shame. You know, we need to find that heartbeat again of why, why should I care? Why should I share? You won't you know? often hear me use a football analogy, but I have to say... I've been watching this World Cup we've been having recently, and I've been watching our team. These kids who are untried, really, on the, on the world ar arena. And hitherto, the policy of the, of the <laughs> English football manager has been, choose the old farts that I know. I mean, they may be a bit creaky and old, but I know who they are. And we don't know who they are. I wouldn't anyway, but I mean, even my son, who, who's interested in football, doesn't know half these players. And they are turning out to be brilliant. That's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, again, I'm not sure they'd like to be associated necessarily with our, our, our politics conversation, but, but yes, if, if there is the idea of representing um, England in that case, you know, or, or in, a, in a new, fresh, relevant way that's nothing to do with the, the lazy arguments that are, that are going on and reintroducing ourselves to the world in a different way, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, a great but also, it's interesting, it's also doing it for Russia. It's, there's so much commentary as well about Russia saying, Actually, all that nonsense that's been spoken about Russia, a lot of it isn't true. You know, the select committees look for the reds under the bed here. They didn't find them. You know, the, the Mueller inquiry has been, you know, publish or be quiet. Yes. You know, there, there isn't collusion. Or if there is, publish or be quiet. And everyone's energy stopped doing all this, these proxy nonsense conversations and just actually said, look, let's just concentrate on the, you know, put up or shut up, help be part of the new representation of our country or shut up okay but i think a lot of this stuff is beyond our reach we can't we can't replace the the cabinet we can't personally topple theresa may and replace it with the jacob yeah. but what can people in our area of th i mean I, I i don't do exactly the same thing as you but in our area of things we're both we're both culture warriors i mean what for example is um verbalization going to do to help shift the Overton window, whatever you do with the Overton window. Yeah. Well, okay. Verbalization is not a politically affiliated company. Okay. I, my personal feelings as the CEO are one thing. You know, I've got a whole mix of people in here. So, okay, sure. um, you know, what we do here is believe in dialogue over division. Now, if that can be to hopefully counteract the effects of radicalization, great. Yeah. If it can be to stand up for really responsible, serious journalism, some of our clients, media organizations like The Times and so forth, to counteract some of the fake news that's coming from other sources, we're delighted to be associated with that. So, you know, verbalization I don't buy into fake news, but I, I think it's a, that's a, a, a liberal left construct largely. No, there, there is a great deal. I mean, we, we see it as part of our work. You know, there is a great deal of manufactured, sophisticated, manufactured misinformation Oh, yeah, put by, out by, by proxy organisations. By Soros on behalf of the European Union. Yeah, yeah, sure. But I, what I mean is, I don't believe it's a, it's a particularly right-wing problem. I, I think no, no, no. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's across, mainly the, coming it's across from the spectrum, left. yeah. So in terms of verbalisation, I'm going I'm to separate it because I've got okay. people in the yeah, organisation yeah. who probably would, would have all, yeah, the whole spectrum of political yeah. views. Yeah. Yeah. Um, personally, what can I do is do this podcast. Yeah. What can I do is write articles and columns and support the people that I believe in politically and, and offer up my services to support them and offer anything I can in terms of strategic thinking to conservatives, modern conservatives, uh, progressive conservatives, uh, to try and reinstill a notion of, of pride and betterment through association with conservative thinking, you know, which I believe personally is the route to um, building a, a you know, <laughs> it's going to sound particularly uh, may, but, but building a, you know, a strong and stable society. But is it, I suppose um, I'm torn when I do what I do between kind of the, the pleasure to be had from trolling the uh, the other side in a kind of an amusing way is fantastic, and I know that that gives our side great pleasure. Mm. Um, but more than trolling the enemy, I mean, should we be reaching out to them? I mean, there's, there's yeah. presumably a, an element of them that are just beyond redemption. Look, it's, it's, you know, you run one of the very few podcasts in this space that has really seriously I intelligent and and. Um, intriguing conversations around these issues with the opinion formers from the right of centre. Right. And it's fantastic. And thank you so much for that because it's a vital role that you're playing. Are you wasting energy or is anyone wasting energy if you're just sort of trolling and creating upset on the other side? 
so much more necessary for the public at the moment, I would say, and for people who think this way, is to providing conservative branded solutions. You know, I said about coping and edging. Yeah. People are in this coping and edging space, especially in this country at the moment, where I'm coping, I need to put food on the table, the, the money is sort of running out, I'm being told. We've got, we've got you know, Brexit down the, the line, I don't know what to think of that. Anyone that's just kind of creating more animosity, creating more issues, making my life harder, I'm not really going to want to invi invite into my life. If all of us as conservatives can think of the ways that conservatism can deliver solutions in the modern world right now, and that doesn't have to come from our politicians, that can come from people who are just interested in the politics of conservatism. Yep. That is so much more uh, going to cut through at the moment and be so right. much more relevant and grow, uh, you know, group aspiration. The consequence of that is the left liberal left, whatever, controlling left, will just be marginalised more and more and more and become, you know, selling yesterday's philosophies, really. So, basically, be more like Trump. Promote that, work out what people want and just ram home that message. Well, I, I, people listening to this podcast will Make I'm Britain sure have, again. have strong views about Trump, so it's almost take away him as the man. It's like, what they have there is a programme. Yeah. and a clear direction and a clear intent. I mean, our manifesto last time in the last election was essentially Ed Miliband's manifesto. I mean, we've turned into a representation of the left. It was what, awful. If you say to me one word at the moment, what does conservatism stand for in one word, I'd be hard pressed to give you that word. What's, where's the guiding light? Where's the single unifying principle that people can rally around and say, yes, I can bring that into my life and understand what it means, but also strategically, I can see what that means for, for the country. You know, Now, is it global Britain? Britain, or is it, you know, Great Britain? And we, we, diversity is part of that, the greatness of the diversity that we have in London. That Steady. should be a beacon for the world, you know. Yeah. Um, we, we're allowing that to become the, the thing, the stick with which we're hit yeah. uh, because of Brexit. And that's just not a fair representation of, of either Conservatives or Brexit or modern Britain. Yeah, no, I'm with you totally. I think we're going to end on that positive note. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we can. Because it's kind of lunchtime, isn't it? Uh, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special and likable and fascinating guest, Sven Hughes of Verbalization. Okay, till next week. Goodbye. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. I want to actually take a couple of the references to Donald Trump from hip hop. And then we're going to try to see if we can figure out why they like Donald Trump. Jay Z said, I'm at the Trump International. Ask for me. Raekwon said, I'm the black Trump. They are comparing themselves to what he represents his wealth, his achievement, capitalism. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson, Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.